You know, there's there's a lot of controversy about Westmoreland, but sometimes some things he got right, and I think the the the, the whole MRF concept is something that that he got right, and he was redeemed. Uh, even though his staff said, pull this unit out, they're getting too sick. He kept it in because he knew there was a shortage of helicopters. And that if something happened down there, you would need mobility and the only way to get it is through boats. And he kept that unit going and, it's, and it saved all those towns during the Tet Offensive. And also delivered a punishing blow to the, to the Viet Cong. It was his idea of an X division, an experimental division that would be river mobile in the Mekong Delta. He had Navy folks on his staff assisting him. It really was his brainchild. He wanted a unit in the Delta. My name is John Sherwood, PhD, Dr. Sherwood John. I'm with the Naval History and Heritage Command, and the Naval History and Heritage Command is the historical agency of the U.S. Navy. I've written six books, uh, three of which are on Viet the Vietnam War, two on air power, one called Fast Movers, another called Afterburner, and the reason I'm on this show is because I've written a book called War in the Shallows which is about Navy coastal and riverine warfare in Vietnam. And the genesis of the Mobile Riverine Force uh, was the lack of aggressiveness of the Arvin in, in, the, in four Corps. So the Arvin, if you add all those numbers up, outnumbered the Viet Cong two to one. And yet the Viet Cong controlled all but a few of the larger towns in the Delta by 1967. Westmoreland's thought, well, he had two thoughts. One, at this stage of the war, it was the search and destroy strategy. So he wanted to search out and destroy the large formations of, of Viet Cong, number one. Number two, he thought, hey, if we inject a U.S. division or elements of a U.S. division into four core, we can maybe motivate the Vietnamese to fight. Just like the U.S. Navy thought, hey, if we take over that coastal, we can motivate them to fight. If we take over the rivers, set up another task, maybe we can motivate them to fight. That, that didn't happen because the, the Vietnamese, they understood that the war was going to last much longer than the U.S. was going to be there and that they needed to save themselves for the real fight let the Americans fight while the Americans were around, and they were going to save themselves for the fight down the road. And in this case, the fight down the road was the, the fight to leave. There were not enough helicopters at that point to create an air mobile, to put in an air mobile division. That might have been the ideal solution. So instead, they looked at this idea of a, a mobile riverine force, and one of, and People might ask, well, why didn't we utilize the Marines? Aren't they better adapted for this type of warfare? Uh, probably, but the Marines were tied up in I Corps. The, the country was divided into tactical zones, and IV Corps with the Mekong Delta was an army zone. I Corps, which is the borderland, was a Marine zone. So the command structure of the MRF was very different from almost any unit deployed to Vietnam. Navy commanding officer controlled it when it was in transit on the water. Whenever the unit was on the land, then the army officer took control. But no single officer was in control. And this harkens back to amphibious doctrine from World War II. In a sense, it was a, re it was a recipe for a disaster. Where you smoothed over the rough edges was with people like Fulton, the first um, Army MRF commander, later became the division commander. Uh, people like Wade C. Wells, people like uh, Dusty Rhodes. They had had a lot of combat experience in their careers and had an affinity, a natural affinity towards their army compatriots. They chose people who 
who could fit, fit well into this role. So it was going to be two river assault squadrons, 45 mod modified landing craft. That, that was the basic, those were the basic operating units carrying elements of a brigade of the U.S. Army 9th Infantry Division. The basic unit was the, t was the Tango boat, which was an LCM-6. It could go about eight knots, carry about 40 troops, had, uh, had a 20 millimeter gun, that was the big gun, it's 50 caliber guns. There was the monitor, which had uh, two 20 millimeters and a 40 millimeter and, a, and an 81 millimeter mortar. The 40 was really the only gun that was effective against bunkers. One type of monitor that might have changed the outcome of the Rock Barai battle was the Zippo monitor. And the Zippo monitor was, uh, and they equipped it with two M10-8 flamethrowers with 225 seconds of fire with a range of 200 to 300 yards. So perfect against these dug-in troops. At Rock Barai, it would have been effective against the, the positions, but if their appearance might have shocked the Viet Cong into just retreating. The whole logistics side of the MRF is extremely interesting. Um, first of all, it, it relied on, on, on a floating base, um, which consisted of Benoit, Colaton. The floating base could, could support 1,900 embarked troops, uh, of the 2nd Brigade, 9th ID, and 1,600 sailors for 10 or more days. And on top of that, there was a dry land base just north of, of Mitaw called Dongtam United, United in Hearts and Minds. And Dongtam was built on reclaimed land. Westmoreland didn't want to seize dry land from the Vietnamese, so he brought in these huge dredgers. Jamaica Bay, I think, was one of the largest dredges in the world. And it could load and unload troops extremely quickly using this turning basin. That was important during the Tet Offensive when in just hours they could load up and, and steam downriver to Mita and relieve the siege in, in Mita and, and then get to, to other places in the Delta working sometimes in a distributed fashion with different parts of the MRF responding to different cities. One of the beauties of the MRF is that the soldiers could fight without carrying a lot on their back. They just needed to carry a little bit of water and whatever, whatever bullets they needed uh, for an operation. The boats could provide organic firepower and the medical boat could, could patch you up if you got minor wound. The first major operations that the Mobile River Marine Force was involved in were called Coronado after the, the training area in, in California. Designed to root out large units of Viet Cong in s several of the provinces, mainly Long An, Din Tong, which is where Mito is, and Gokong, and, and basically the ones that were not far from Dongtam and the terminus of Route 4, which is the main route that runs from Saigon to Mita. The Rock Barai battle was Coronado 5, and the idea there was they wanted to entrap a a, a battalion of Viet Cong, the 263rd Battalion, um, in the Kam Som area, which is really not very far from Dong Tam. The Navy element was commanded by Captain Wade C. Wells. He's a, he was a destroyer officer from World War II, so a tin can sailor, a pretty hard-nosed guy. You would have two units of the, of the MRF, 3rd Battalion, 47th Infantry, and then the third of the 60th. And there'd be another unit, a mechanized unit, the fifth of the 60th. Now David took two companies from the third of the 47th and reinforced the mechanized unit. So you'd have the third of the 47th landing south of this Viet Cong position, third of the 60th north, and then the mechanized unit coming in from the, the east. And the, 
and with the river to their backs, the idea was that it would annihilate this battalion. That's a, not exactly what happened. The Rock Barai runs into the Mita River, which is one of the major arteries of the Mekong Delta. And that's the river that runs past Dong Tam, and then there's a PBR base at, at, Mi, at Mita. When you go up the Rock Barai, you go up for I don't know how many kilometers, but then soon there's this big bend in the river. That's Snoopy's nose. And then you go further, and that was, the, that was where the 263rd was at a very narrow piece of the river that was only 30 meters wide. And the idea was to, to get these boats in this narrow area into a kill zone and use the B-40s, which the B-40s couldn't necessar wouldn't necessarily sink one of these LCM-6s, but they would create enough shrapnel from the, the, the burn of the heat round to injure people in the well deck. And all of those things caused massive amounts of casualties, both for, our, for Army and Navy personnel on those boats. I would say that one of the Achilles heels of the MRF was how slow it traveled. So eight knots at full speed, that's eight knots is when the current is behind you and, and the tides are with you and everything is right. They were slow, cumbersome craft. One of the biggest problems with the MRF was not getting shot at by B-40 rockets or the slowness of the LCM-6s, but something called paddy foot, which was basically a fungal infection of the foot along with a fever. And what it meant was you, could, you needed about 24 hours of time to dry out for 24 hours for every 48 hours in the field, or you were combat ineffective. Because there were so many, so many days had to be wasted drying out. They never could come up with a cure. The legacy of the MRF, it was successful in Vietnam, but I don't know if it would ever be successful again because of the changing, changing technology. You, I don't think you could ever have that many troops in such slow moving boats in a modern day operational setting. You might be able to have something like the river patrol force where you had two boats working, working together, moving at very high speeds, supported by intelligence and air power. For anyone interested in reading the War in the Shallows book, which is an award-winning book, um, see the link in the description. You can download it for free as a PDF. If you want to actually buy a hardcover version, uh, you can buy it at any, any bookstore or the government printing office bookstore.